I didn't because I hadn't done them yet. But you can uh -oh. edit it afterwards. I'm with you. I think you're going to do it. <laughs> you can edit it afterwards, right? Yeah, but once you've submitted. Once you've submitted it, yeah, I'll go through that a little bit here mm -hmm. and talk Great. to you about that. There, there's chicken and the egg problems in the homework. The last one that you do when you mark that done, if you've already done everything, it's for a pointless. So, yeah. But so, like, I went back and edited stuff afterwards. That doesn't want to No. It doesn't automatically. Yeah. It's one of those things where I've got instructions that you can't have in your checksum file because you haven't done them. If, you, if you're following the directions exactly, you'll end up with a slightly different file than you, you wanted. I'll go through it in a second. Do you want me to go back and change that you said that I did the file name weird? Oh, no. It's okay. Yeah, this is a getting used to the shell, so. Okay. Lecture eight. All right, today I'm going to have you guys work totally from the virtual machine. It was causing me problems, switching back and forth between the Mac and the virtual machine. So I'm going to just live in the virtual machine, and you should too. Otherwise, it'll get a little confusing. So let me talk a little bit about the homework before we go any farther. In this first homework, I'm going to be lenient on some things. If you made some mistakes, it's your first time digging into Emacs and working with some of the stuff. If you get to the end, there's one slight problem, I believe. So if you're down here working on build your submission. So there's a to-do item in your build a submission. And if you're building your submission, and then you do the checksum of it, and then you mark it to-do in the file that you're working on, it's not going to be in your end answer. If you mark that, I expect to see that to-do not marked as done yet when you create your tar. Because you're working on this stuff, you've saved your org file that you're working on and you've exported it and then when you're done with that entry then I would expect you to go back and flag it as done. But at that point you've already put it all into a tar and checksummed it. If you mark it done, well, I will never see that. So it's okay if that's not marked as done. And if you have it one way or the other, that doesn't matter. But what does matter is go through here and try to pay very close attention to detail with command line it's a little less forgiving if you on one side of the button versus the other side of the button in a GUI. It'll probably work in both ways. But here, if you have typos or you're not following the instructions exactly, you'll do things that aren't what's expected in the assignment. For example, if you send me a tar file in the email, our email server might tell you to take a hike and then it thinks that's a virus and a, it's got a script in there and, and it'll bounce it. Or it might give you all kinds of crazy virus warnings. What I was asking for was just the checksum. So when you're submitting it, just send the checksum. And if I don't respond to you in a return email, that means either what you sent me didn't make sense or I didn't get it. Like it got eaten by a spam filter. And I think that there's at least one homework that's been had that happen to it where our email filter sucked it into the great nothing and destroyed the homework in the email. So just send the checksum, just that number and your file name as MD5SUM puts that out. And that will make it through our email filtering, no problem, and I will go look at the server for your homework. But just remember, attention to detail is super important with this stuff. Right now, you're probably having a hard time knowing what's detail that matters and what doesn't, so just try to be careful about everything. And you'll start seeing when, if you press an extra space in something, it might be okay. Right now, it's gonna be hard for you to guess that. So just try to follow exactly what's going on, and you'll start to get a little bit better sense of that. So let's jump into today's notes. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to download the org file. I've started putting the org file. So here's lecture eight for September 22nd. There are the HTML files here and the org file. If I click on it, there will be the org file. So I'm going to back up. I'm going to right click on it, save link as, and I'm going to save this lecture eight right into my home directory. And then I'm going to put away Firefox for now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into what I want is right back there behind that bar. <laughs> but before I do that, I've almost forgotten to do something that I've, a new thing for this class that I'm going to try and do. And that's I'm going to go open up a terminal. And you guys don't follow along with this because you don't have it. Applications, accessories, terminal. I wrote a script for today that is going to grab my screen every few seconds and save it to an image. 
And then I can go back through and find the critical images and make a little PDF or something that will have the key pictures from today. So you don't just have to hear it and read about it. You can actually see a few of the pictures. I think especially with Emacs, having screenshots of what actually happens is going to be helpful. And the video gets pretty big quick. So I'm going to ignore that terminal for the rest of class. And I'm going to go and open up Emacs. And you should too. So feel free to download this org file into Emacs. I'm going to split the window in two. And I'm going to have the org mode file on one side. And I'm going to open up a shell on the other side. Ben reminded me that you can actually use a terminal shell with inside of Emacs. And that will reinforce that the shell and Emacs like to play together. And when you see hotkeys in Emacs, they often work in the bash shell too. When we do things like cut and paste with the keyboard, it's not, there'll be another key in addition to control C, things like that. There'll be a special one for Emacs that'll actually work in the shell as well. So I'm going to make this big. I'm going to try and write the commands up here, but if I do something and I forget to write it up here and you're getting confused, just let me know. The first one, we're going to open up a directory. So if you open up files from the menu, we're going to ignore the menus. And unfortunately, my fingers know the command, but not my brain. CXCF will open a file. One of the nice files you can do with Emacs is the period, or as somebody pointed out, full stop. Mm -hmm. So let's see if I can do that. So control X, control X, control F, and it will say find file down at the bottom there. And those of you in the back, you may have to sort of stand up to see some of this. Remember that tilde is your home directory. So if we just put a period on there, so it's ending up being tilde slash was already there for me, and I put a period. And I'm going to hit Enter. And you're now going to see your home directory. Unfortunately, it's got all of your dot files, too. So it's a little crowded looking. And I'm going to go find lecture 8, which I believe is in. So I did a Control X, Control F. And then if you start pressing Tab, it wants to help you complete, just like the shell did. I'm going towards Download. So I press a D, a capital D. And you'll start seeing the D-related things. So downloads, and there's nothing in there. Where did it save it to? OK, I'm going to show you the search command, because I'm going to be using this all throughout today, and I'm going to forget if I don't otherwise. In Emacs, there is a very powerful search, and then there's the normal search. I am lazy, and I use the normal search. Hopefully, by the end of the semester, I'll teach you guys the super powerful search, and you'll be doing really amazing stuff. Control and the letter S. That's a lowercase s, so that's a Control S, and then you start typing. And that's going to do a search for you. So if we do Control S, you'll now see at the bottom it says iSearch. And there's other kinds of searches, but this is the simple one. We're just going to start typing. So I'll type, how about uh, drop, D-R-O-P, for Dropbox. And you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff related to Dropbox there. It's highlighting one of them. And if you press this Control S again a second time, it's going to jump to the next one. So I'll do a Control S. We're on the next Dropbox, Control S, and you'll be on this next Dropbox. And now we get to the bottom. I did it one more time. It's failing search because I'm at the end of the file. So did you open up the dot? So open up the period, the full stop? Full yeah. Yep, so press that, period. OK, and then make this, click on this, and make that full screen under the, the, the little square button. Yeah, press that. So now that's full screen. Click into that little mini window and press a period. Now press Enter. Now remember, if you're currently stuck in split mode where you've got two different screens, that was Control X1 to unsplit from last time. And if you need to be able, to, if you're in the wrong window, we're going to be hitting a lot of little uh, quirks in the beginning as you guys get used to this. If you're in the wrong window and you want to be down here, but you're actually somewhere else and it's trying to work down here, you can just click down in that bottom section. Wave your hand if you're stuck. We'll, we'll get to all of you. Awesome. Everybody's stuck. Perfect. First starters, why don't you go ahead and make Emacs be the full screen? So everybody, if you don't have Emacs being full screen, just forget about everything else for now and hit that start up Emacs, click the square box, the the right hand, yeah, there you go. 
Okay, so go ahead and open up that directory. So control X, control F, and then period, AKA full stop, press enter. Yep, there you go. So now you're in the directory edit mode, and now you can do a control S and start trying to search and try drop, D-R-O-P. And you can see as you type, it's starting to catch more and more stuff. And now do control S again. And if you want to get out of that, control G is the quit key. And I'm going to keep saying these until you guys are sick of hearing me say them. It takes a while. Control G, yep. yep. I was at a point where um, it was not highlighting it here, so if I did Dropbox. Yep, so, so you are, scroll down away. see how your scroll bar is down here? Uh -huh. You scroll up, and then say just click somewhere up at the top, not on text. Yep, so now you're going to start seeing it match if you do Control S and then drop, and then Control S again and control S. And it's going to fail, so keep doing it until it fails, and if you do it one more time, you go back to the top of the file. Okay, so if I get to the bottom, so I basically need to use the arrow keys. Yeah, uh, you don't have to, you know, you can start from the bottom, it'll fail, press control S again, and it jumps to the top. So you've actually searched for a capital drop. I was going to suggest lowercase. Right now I'll explain, if you type any capital letters in your search, it becomes case sensitive. If you type all lowercase, it'll match either upper or lower case. Do a control G to quit. G is in George. Now do a control S and then drop, D-R-O-P. No, don't click anywhere. Oh wait, How, what mode are you in? Yeah, click down here, you're right. And type drop. Uh, don't press enter because enter then uh, ends your the search. So click back in here. Now control S, so applications accessories, Emacs. The first little bit they use Emacs, it seems insane, and then eventually you see it and it starts really making sense. Am I in the right track? Or? Yeah, so click into your, this is called the mini buffer at the bottom, so click this right way? after drop. Yep. Now press control S again, and see how it says failing? Don't click anywhere else. And if you do it one more time, it's gonna come back and start searching from the top. Uh, nope, not oh. yet. We're just playing with search. Oh, oh okay. And remember, if there's like two split windows and you don't want to see that bottom one, control X and then just a one will make that go away. So I'm looking for lecture eight is what I was looking for before we started doing search. And so if I do a control S and I wasn't seeing it because it was not where I thought it would be, eight dash, it's not finding it. I type control S a second time. It found it up at the top. And then when your cursor is somewhere on this file, just press the enter or return key, and you're now looking at today's lecture notes. So I'm gonna be copying and pasting from the lecture notes into a terminal all inside of Emac. And if this doesn't confuse you guys, then I'm not doing enough, right? I've confused both of you guys, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm on, I, I didn't have Dropbox installed, so I just installed Dropbox, but I uh, connected to my own account. Did you want me to connect to a special account? Nope, nope, your own, your own Dropbox. Okay, perfect. And, and for this case, Dropbox, we may use it today if you want to get a file someplace oh, yeah. later on and we get stuck. Right. But yeah, download it from Firefox. So if you don't have this file, go into Firefox here and right click on the org file on the research tools page. Troubles over here? <laughs> yeah, what's uh, going on? I don't know. I Control G and... Okay, so start over. Yep, so you're looking for the, were you looking for the eight? Just eight dash? Mm-hmm. What's control G? Control G is the quit. Can you save it in your Dropbox? You can if you want. Okay. If you're comfortable putting it in your Dropbox and then going there, that's great. I'm just going to leave it in my home directory for today. Down the road, it's up to you how to organize things. I'll give you suggestions. In fact, I'll give you one today, but it doesn't really matter. When you hand it in to me on the server, the location will matter, so I can find it. But other than that, it's if you can find it. So the eight dash can enter twice. Or so did you download the the org mode file from? Ooh, you're really having fun. Now. I don't. Awesome. <laughs> Just to warn you, uh, Emacs is quite capable of opening up archives like zips and .dev files, and you can end up looking inside of some compressed thingy. And I'm going to get you out of this real quick. Uh, okay.
So I opened up your home directory. I did a control X, control F, and a period. Okay. And then hit enter. So this is all I need to do right now. That's, yes. Here. Did you download the org mode file? Uh, in Firefox, like from the class web page? Mm, from today? Yep. No. So backup one. And right click on the org. Um, and save. You can also, if you don't want to do it inside of Emacs, you can go back and forth from Firefox, but it's best if you just get used to this, just save it in your home directory, just hit save. Is everybody able to save that file into their home directory? It's H dash, so it's that one right up here. So you can do control S, H, and then a dash, and see how it says failing? Press control S, and you'll go back up to the top and find it. Okay, now just press enter, and you'll open the file. Oh, press enter again, there you go. Are we supposed to be opening this by now? Yes. Okay. We find it and then now, if you haven't downloaded it, when you're in the directory edit mode, the letter G will refresh your directory view. You want to save that file into your home directory. And how to... Press enter to finish your search. And press enter again to open the file. Awesome. You just opened up a binary file. <laughs> <laughs> Emacs will happily do that. It's OK. Control X, zero, closes the window that you're in and then just the number zero. Open up your home directory again. So control X, control F, period, enter. Okay, now scroll all the way up. Press G to reload your directory. And see how there's an eight up at the top, eight dash more? You can either click on that or move the mouse up there with the arrow keys and then press enter on that line. Anybody not have this file up yet? Excellent. You are in research tools. How do you know? Where are you seeing that? Because you're sitting here in research tools. Oh, I know. Me physically. Sure. Gotcha. <laughs> um, you've opened up a Debian file or some related stuff. How so would I do that? Go click on the buffers menu up here. But I don't want to click. Yeah. Okay. Uh, control X, Control F, period. Open up your home directory. Yep. Press Enter. Now. To refresh that, you can hit the letter G. And now you see how you have this 8 dash more appeared up at the top? Okay. Press Enter. And you are now looking at the file. Nice. All right. Yeah, that's what I did before. Yeah, you missed one thing, though, and it's all. So the next thing we're going to do is we want to be able to split this in two so that we can see the class notes in one and we can work in the other. If you press Control X and then the number 2, it's going to split, and if you want to see that in the menu, that's right here with split window, control X, and then two. So these two, the unsplit and the split, are related. So we now have two views into the same file, which is a little strange. We can scroll around and work in one, and the other one doesn't change. So for really long documents, that's kind of cool. You can go to the end, and you can work on something, and you can see another part. It also can be a little strange if, for example, I start typing in one, it appears in the other, which can be a little disturbing. But what we're going to do is we're going to start a shell in one of them. And I'm going to put it up top because then we can see better up there. In Emacs, so we have the control, the C. There's another one. This M means meta. And there's two ways to do this one. Unfortunately, this one is the confusing one. There used to be a meta key on the keyboard, and probably only two of us in here have seen keyboards with the meta key on them. I believe that's Alt on the Dell keyboard. So if you hold down Alt, so you're... Press two. You've done lots of stuff. Okay, excellent. <laughs> so, so what you can do, yeah. if you want to close, so right now you're in two windows that you don't want to have, you can do Control X and then a zero. You're clicking on too many things with the mouse, so. Leave the mouse alone there for a second. Take your hand off the mouse. Take your hand. This is the keyboard. Stick to the keyboard. So <laughs> control X and then a zero. The number zero. So that went away. Control X and a zero. Now that went away. So now you can do the split, which is control X two. And I'll tell everybody else about the control X zero in a second. So control X and then two. And now the number two. Excellent. Does it give four or five? Does that give you four or five windows? Three will split this way. Yeah. There's a bunch of other ones. They all have weird mappings. There's hundreds of mappings. 
when I split the screen, mm -hmm. why didn't I get like from the beginning? It started from here. Because you, if you scroll around, it will change things a little bit. It's okay to be wherever in each of them. Okay. There, there's nothing wrong with that. You, it's okay. So if you want to get rid of the window that you're in, there's control X zero, that's the number zero, get rid or hide. And that hides it wherever the cursor is. Yes, and control X and, uh-oh, now I'm gonna have font troubles on the board. This is the letter O as in offset, and that says go to the other window. So if you're in one, you wanna jump to the other, You'll see it in a minute, I'm going to do a lot of this, where I'm going to go to, from one window to the other, all with a keyboard, and I'm not going to touch the mouse. So control X other. How do you unhide? You can just go up to the menu and select that buffer, and we'll, we'll do lots of buffer jumping later on. I think it's control X B, switch to buffer, and then if you press tab in that, you'll get a list of buffers that you have available. We're going to go through this a lot throughout the semester. I expect you guys not to get it all today. The windows, but the yep. window have to cool. close it. Great. If you want to get rid of one of these, like... Like this one. We hit. We hit. Yep. We need only so two. So use Control X and then an O to jump to the next one. Put put the mouse away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> control X o. and then the letter O without the control. Yep. And that moved you from this one to this one. Okay. Do it one more time and you'll jump up to the top. Okay, but if I want to remove only just yep. one thing too. Yep. Keep going. So Control, control X. Control X O. Now you're in the top one. Okay. So let's get rid of that one. So Control X and then the number zero. So okay. Control X and the number zero. zero. Poof. And if you can also drag that oh. middle bar up and down a little bit if it's not where you want to see it. I'll show you guys that. This one, you, I don't know the keyboard shortcut, so don't ask. So you can drag this bar up and down and control what's where. As you get stuck, just wave your hands and, all right. <laughs> Keep waving your hands until you get comfortable. So you've got this switch to buffer going on below. Yeah, and how so do you, I get out of that? Do a control X and then O to jump to the other window, which happens to be the mini buffer. The quick key is control G, and there you go. All right, you guys are actually getting it a lot faster than I ever did. So. What's the alt key again? Okay, back to where we're going. The alt key, hopefully on this, is, is probably the meta key. So hold down the alt key. Press the letter X once, and you're going to see a little M-X appear. And now I'm going to do a bad thing, because I, I'm tempted. Type the word Tetris, and press Enter. And you now are facing Tetris. If, if I catch you playing tons of Tetris during class, I'll be very disappointed. But it's my own fault. Let's see everybody have Tetris up, because... So you pressed Alt, and then an X. Yeah. Now let go. Now type Tetris. The space bar. <laughs> okay. We now have the most serious class in CCOM. <laughs> Control G. To start over, yep. So now do meta X. And then type Tetris. Press enter. All right, we have Tetris. We have everybody almost playing Tetris, except for down here. Okay. Okay, that's all right. Uh, so just do you are where you are, which is fine, and just do Meta X. So the Alt, and press X, and then type Tetris. Press Enter. The key thing to learn now is how to get rid of Tetris. Control X, and the letter K, is kill buffer. So I'm going to start Tetris up here, and then I'm going to kill it. So meta x Tetris. So now I started Tetris. I'm going to type the letter, or the control x. So you see a, a CX at the bottom, and I'm going to press the letter K without a control. It's going to say kill buffer. It's going to default to the most recent buffer that you've used, or you can hit tab and you'll see a list. But we want the default, so just hit enter, and Tetris should be off your screen. Do a control X one. I think you've got like multiple something is going on. Okay, now do a control X, the letter K, press enter. 
Failed to access scores? That's okay. <laughs> it's set up to have a score file, and the permissions are funny on the score file, so it can't save your high score. So I'm sorry that we can't keep a record of your high score. Uh, so yeah, you can do a control X K in that one if you want. When you're in that list of buffers, do you have to type the name, or is there a way to uh, tab through them? There's a couple different ways to do it. So if I'm going to kill a buffer, so if I do control X K and I'm in the dured mode up top, it defaults to one. I press tab. It'll give me a list. So then I can start going through them. And I believe you can actually click with the mouse if you want to, too. If you hit tab, it's going to wait. And if I try and hit like eight and then tab, it'll then fill that out for me. And remember control. If you don't want to keep going, hit control G and it'll quit. Is there a command to just like undo the last thing I did? Undo the last thing you did. If you go under edit, there is yeah. undo does not have the key listed. It's control, and then you have to hold down the shift key, and it's the underscore. I believe sometimes it's mapped to meta Z or Windows Z or something like that, but I'm not sure. That seems to be. But if you're in, if it won't undo window changes, so it only undoes editing inside of one of the windows. So what are you looking to undo here? I'm just trying to, I accent, I don't know what I press. So do control X zero and that's when we'll go away. And now you can do a control X two and oh, we'll split and this guy. Perfect. Thank awesome. You. So let's go ahead and start the shell, which is where we were trying to go to a, a while back. Uh, you got to watch out. I have too much fun with Emacs and we could do this like forever. Do the meta X thing that we just did. And this time meta X shell. And this will get you a nice little terminal. Meta X, so you'll see the M dash X. I'll type the, the word shell and press enter. And I'm now in a shell much like the bash terminal. It's going to work a little bit differently here and there, but it's going to work a lot easier with Emacs once you're used to Emacs. The first, expect that for the next three or four lectures, the next three or four lectures, Emacs is going to feel weird. And by the end of the semester, someone will ask you what the keystroke was and you won't know but your fingers know. It's kind of strange. A lot of times if you ask me something, I have to walk over to a keyboard and do it. It's there, and if you get stuck, you can do almost all of this stuff from the menus. So there is lots of options up here of things to do. Next time, I'm going to get you guys logging in org mode so that for the rest of the semester, you'll be taking notes inside of org every class. And I'm going to have you, you can write whatever you want, but there needs to be an entry for every class after this one. We'll give you one more class to sort of get used to Emacs before you have to start logging stuff in it. Come Tuesday, I want you guys to have a log file open, be able to create an entry for the day, and then put at least one little thing in it for each class that we have for thereafter. We'll skip that for now. Let's go work with some data. So you guys haven't gotten to make any plots yet, and I apologize. And today, is, we're going to try and correct that as fast as we can. We're going to go plot some data. Remember, if you're in the other window, you can always do Control X O, or I'm going to be lazy and use the mouse. And the very first thing that we're going to do is in this begin source, we're going to make a directory tree. And remember, the dash P creates multiple directories if it needs to. So you can either type that, or you can copy it. but We'll type it. So we're going to create a directory called class. We'll have each class under there as a number. We'll go into class 8. And you can still do all the normal stuff that you would do with a terminal. Later on, if you want, we can actually open up this directory through directory edit mode at the same time, and we can get ourselves really confused. <laughs> but this is where we'll work today. I've gotten frustrated with this command called wget. So we're going to switch today. I'm going to use a command called curl, or C-U-R-L. It's another tool that goes out to the web and gets files. Now, it's not installed. I would suggest opening up a terminal. So we'll do applications, accessories, terminal, because VMware is hiding our nice quick start. Do sudo apt-get space install curl, C-U-R-L. Press Enter. Type in the old password here. So you're going to use this password right here. And if you notice for me, it said, oh, you know, it's already installed. Don't worry. But for you, you should see a yes or no question. Do we want to install a bunch of stuff? 
and it should take all of about 10 seconds to install. So Y and then enter, or yes. Back to Emacs. So we now have curl. Let's go get the data off the server. So we can do edit, copy. So now you're going to type the research tools password, so the exclamation point RT. They're different, written by different people, and they have never come to an agreement about how it should be done. So they're all slightly different. If you really want to know, I will point you at the man pages, and you can then uh, try. Yes, you can do man curl, man wget, and then try to figure out why one is better than the other. And if you come up with a conclusion, I'd love to hear it. They both are kind of cool, and they both. Just take the first line. Yep, you guys are doing great. Installing, excellent. By the end of this class, you will all be professional system administrators. Great. <laughs> okay. I have downloaded this one, but uh -huh. I cannot see the class. Okay, so click in that window where you've got all this loading stuff, or you can do Control X and then the letter O as an offset. So now do Control X, press the letter B for switch buffers, hit Tab. So it's giving you a list. And see how there's the eight dash more up there? Just type the letter eight, now hit Enter. The next thing that you're going to do is we're going to learn paste. So if you highlighted that stuff and you've already done the paste, well, then you're ahead. The paste command is actually called yank. This is old terminology that came about before Microsoft Windows and before Microsoft. Before, yeah, before Microsoft, yes, most definitely. So yank was what they called it way back when in the 1970s. So that's their equivalent of paste, is yank. So if I just type control Y in here, I'll paste that command in, or you could have done edit paste, which unfortunately doesn't have the alias in there, but press enter, and you should then have downloaded your data. If you highlight a region, so if you want to start marking a region, it's control, this right here is the space bar. So you press the space bar, that marks the beginning of where you're selecting. You can then move around with the arrow keys. Well, eventually I'll teach you all of the, the keyboard motion stuff. Then when you get to the end, there's two things. There's meta W and control W. Meta W I think is copy and this is cut. Control, let me actually do this here. And so if we do control space, we're marking the beginning of the line. Now if I do a control W, the line's gone, but I've now I can press control Y, bring it back. If I do a bunch and I do a meta W, which sometimes you'll see escape, you can also hit the escape key by itself and it's a little bit different. That'll copy it. The crazy thing about this is that it saves every single thing that you have copied or cut since you started the program in a giant ring buffer. So there's tons of these around. And so you actually can go back to something that you copied like 15 minutes ago and find it in there. You'll then be able to paste all kinds of crazy stuff. And if you can keep track of that stuff, awesome. I, I can't. I can remember the last one or two maybe, so I don't try to remember all those. But if you save something a while back and you want to get it back, it's in here. You know, so like my randomly hitting the keyboard is now saved in there. So now you've got that, and we scroll down the notes a little bit more. We need to uncompress this, because again, we saw this is a bz2 file. So we type file, star in here, you'll see that we have one bzip2 compressed. So the command was b unzip. Tab completion works, so if you type bun and press tab, it'll complete out to b unzip2, our file name. So holes.csv.bz2. So we've got ourselves some data. We can start running some of these commands. You'll get used to, if we get data file, you know, what, what's in there, how do we look at it? So these commands will help you do that. So word count, dash L for number of lines, holes. So we have 3,047 lines in this file. Let's take a look at that. We'll run the head command on it, head holes.csv. What we have in here is a database that I got from, I believe, University of Texas from their database manager that lists everywhere that the international drilling programs have put these boreholes into the ocean. So there's 3,047 holes in this database where scientists have gone out and drilled a substantial hole into the seafloor all over the globe. And it's still working. That's a little weird. 
Um, press enter again. Or you mind if I use your keyboard real quick and just see what's going on? We're going to kill it and start over. <laughs> All right, so go ahead and open up another shell. So do a, like you can just click down here and do a meta X shell. So now do a meta X. So alt X and then type shell, enter. Now CD, oh wait, you're already there, great. So now you can do an LS dash L. Let's see what we got. Okay, you have, a, looks good. Now so try that word count again. So WC space dash L space holes dot CSV. Sometimes by clicking on random stuff, you end up in a mode and I'm not always sure which, what it is. So we can always start back over and awesome. I'm not sure either, but take a look under buffers. We'll just use the GUI here. See how it says the third one down is shell? Yeah. Select that one. Okay. Click in the click into this window here, do it again and select like eight. eight. Yeah. What does GUI mean? Graphical user interface is GUI. G U I. <laughs> Ewe GUI, you know. <laughs> Alright, so now we've got the word count. What we've got in here is the way comma separated values files tend to work, if you're lucky, is that hopefully the first line lists out the columns that you want. Uh, a lot of times that won't be the case and you'll have to guess and that's no fun. But here, the first column, so these ones here is expedition. This next number here is going to be site. Then this is the hole within that site. So they have some naming scheme for how they have these things. Program. So here, this is DSDP, deep sea drilling program. There's also ocean drilling program. We'll see those in a minute. Here's your, your longitude and your latitude. This is the part that we care the most about because we can plot that on a map. The water depth in meters and how much core they got back out of the seafloor. So let's go and see if we can do something with this data because I think this is pretty exciting stuff. So we're going to use the cut command to try and learn a little bit more about this. So now we're going to use the cut command. And before we've, we've done this before, so we can use the dash D for cut to say what our delimiter is and we can cut it into different fields. If you want to learn a little bit more about the cut command, I would re recommend go and read that man page. It's uh, boring but useful. And we can say we want to cut a particular field. So in this case, if we look up here, we have expedition is field number one, site is field number two, hole is field number three, and the fourth one is program. So let's see if we can find out what programs are in this file. If we do four and we say holes.csv and just pipe that to head, you'll see we get a whole bunch of DSDPs and the, the first one, the program. And the neat thing about Unix is we can start combining things together. So if I teach you another command called unique, we do, and the neat thing about this is I think this will work, is you can just scroll up to an old command and you can edit it. So what I've done is I've gone up, up above to an old command that I had. I've changed it to be something different because before I had head here. And you can just edit that to be unique, U-N-I-Q. And what that will do is it takes the input to it and it finds all the lines that are duplicates and collapse them down to just the unique entries. So this is a neat command to use if you have a whole bunch of data and it's, a lot of it's repetitive. So here we had over 3,000 lines of entries. We ran unique on it and we found out that there's three programs in here. So there's the deep sea drilling program, DSDP. The, which came next is the ocean drilling program. And finally came the international ocean drilling program, IODP. And what we can do then is if we can slice these apart based on, you know, if we want to make a plot on each one of those, or we can figure out how many are in each one of these. I believe in the reading room right behind Ben's back, there are, next to that is the library. And in there, we have some of these volumes from these drilling programs. So if you find a site that's particularly interesting, you can go read all about it. But let's go take another look at uh, what we have here. So what we can do is we can use a command called grep that we used before, search for all the entries with DSDP in the file holes.csv, and we can do a word count on that. So we've taken the output from, we've taken the holes.csv file, the grep command searches for a pattern. So any line that contains the four letters in a row, DSDP, it's going to return only those. So I'll show you, if we rerun this with head, the one thing is there's some weird quirks when you run head, sometimes things get grumpy. 
and this will return anything that matches DSDP, which is pretty boring. You know, we can then go and do the same thing where we do egrep ODP holes.csv, the vertical bar for the pipe, word count dash L. We came up with 1930 for the ODP, egrep IODP holes.csv, word count dash L. Now there's something a little bit wrong going on here. So we've got 3047 total lines. The first one of those is a program line, but then we've got 1,116 for one, 1,930 for the next, and 153 for the IODP. And that looks like it's more than the number of lines that we expected to have, the 3,047. Why might there be more lines in those three grep commands than what we saw in the actual total word count list for the whole file. Why are we seeing more entries than we expected? Does anyone have a thought as to why that might be? Exactly, you're picking up the ODP and the IODP. So when you search for ODP, it's also picking up the IODP because inside the word IODP is the three letters ODP. So that's kind of frustrating. But we can take a quick peek at that and I'll show you a neat little trick. I'm gonna grab this text here. So I did control space. I used the control E is jump to end of line, a really handy one. So there's control E is jump to end, and control A is jump to beginning of a line. And if you want to copy a whole line, that's a really easy thing to do. So I did a control E, and then I did a meta W, so I copied that. I'm gonna do a control X, O, jump over to the other one, I'm going to do the control Y and paste it. Within a couple weeks, you guys will be able to speak. So you're, you know, some of you come with from another country, you're working on your English, and you're going to also learn how to speak Emacs. And Emacs will be the strangest language that you know. So if we run this command, we're going to actually count those out and see that it's more. So if you run echo without the BC, it's going to print out this string and it's going to pipe it to this little command called BC, and that's binary calculator. Yep. Okay, if you want to do selection, we'll jump, we'll do that again. So I'm going to do control space at the beginning of the echo, and I'm going to skip the control E because I'm just going to grab part of it and show you guys. So, uh, so the mark can turn on or off. If you keep doing control space, you're going to toggle it basically. Mark activated when you're starting. So now I'll use the arrow keys. Okay. And now you can do meta W. And we're gonna keep going through this every day for pretty much the rest of the semester. So I've done the meta W, control X O to go to the other side, control X Y to paste just the echo command. That takes that text, so I built a little equation. I just took the three numbers with plus, and then I passed it to the binary calculator that then calculated out that sum. Now, we're not going to do too much with these things after today and t Tuesday, because after this, we're going to sort of ignore these guys mostly and go do a lot of Python. But it's great to have these up your sleeve when you're just working with data, trying to figure things out. And you can use them from within inside of the IPython shell that we'll be starting to use soon. So if you wanted to make this better, and we do um, egrep ODP, from our hole, so we want to see the first example of that. I'm just going to let it go and scroll through some of this to show you guys that the way this text is is it has a comma, ODP, and a comma for the ODP ones. And if we go to the bottom, it's comma IODP comma. So you can start looking at the text and see if there's if you can use a little extra information to figure out how to just get those. So if we grab the old one and we run the old grep just for fun here. So if we paste that with a control Y. So here I've run the old command with egrep ODP holes and we can use those commas to help ourselves out. If we put a comma and a comma on either side of that ODP and if you look in the notes I only needed one of them. You can sort of make these commands whichever way works well for you. I don't need it. Nope. I just felt like 
right now I want to do it slightly differently because I feel like seeing both commas helps me out mentally figure out what's going on. I can rerun that and it comes out a little bit lower and it's removed those IODP entries in there. Is there a command yep. for it, like in terminal, how you can press the up arrow and it'll do your last thing? You can type history and then you can use the exclamation point and the command number. So if I wanted to rerun the BC one, which is 318, I can do bang 318. But well, what if you wanted, like say you were, didn't just want to type it all out, you know, you wanted to change one little bit of it. We had the control S for search. There's control R for search back the other way, if that's a little bit easier. So I can do a control R search backwards and I can type pipe BC the, and it has to be exact match. And I can keep hitting back until I get to it with control R and then I can go edit this. There's an infinite number of ways to slice this. And so if you ask, Ben's done a lot of this. He has a really great textbook that he wrote a while back that is still right on the money for all this stuff. We'll each have slightly different ways to do it. They're both right. I'm not sure how you guys are getting into this mode, but let's see. Break. There you go. So if you do signals, break, it will help get you out of that. I'll show everybody that. Thank you. So with Emacs, it's using all of these keys like control C. If you want to do something like the control C that we use in the terminal, there's a menu item here called signals, and you can send a control C to that terminal. There's a hot key, it's control C, control C here. But if you hit that, it's like hitting control C, except for it writes out on the screen, menu bar signals break. If we do control C, control C, it's effectively doing breaking out of a, a command in the terminal. So if you guys end up in a mode where nothing's happening in this Emacs shell, go up to signals and select break. Let's go make a plot of this because I really want to see this data before we end today. I've got a little section talking about a program called GNU plot. We're only going to use GNU plot today and then I'm going to force myself to never touch it again for the rest of class. I know, sad faces. But uh, we're going to focus on matplotlib from Python after this, but I wanted to show you at least one other plotting program. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of plotting programs for Linux, and they all have their trade-offs. GNU plot is an old standby. It's just really hard to make it as uh, customized and as functional as matplotlib being inside of Python. What we need to do for this is we need to take that data and we need to pull out the latitude and longitude to try and plot it up. And one trick that you can do with maps is they don't have to be in any projection. So you're going to hear a lot about projections from me and other people, but you can just plot coordinates. If it's UTM, you can just plot it in a graph. And it might be a lot confusing because you don't have coordinate frames and scale bars and things like that on it. But if you just want to see what's in there and see if the data looks good, just plotting whatever coordinate numbers happen to be in there and seeing what comes out can be very helpful. And you're going to see here that we'll, we'll get a surprise. So if we just take a quick look at, go ahead and we're going to run a cut command and we're going to see if we can pull out the fifth and the sixth columns for that. So I'll do this by hand real quick. So grep program, or we'll use the same one, egrep program, holes, and I pulled out that first line by grabbing for, I know the word program is only in the sort of table of contents line at the beginning. And so expedition is one, sites two, Holes three, programs four, longitude or X is going to be five, and latitude is going to be six. So I can use that same cut command and say cut dash D for comma. Let's split on those commas. And we'll grab columns five and six. And for holes CSV. And looky there, we got lucky and got it right, no typos. We saw lots of latitudes and longitudes and latitudes. People tend to say lat long a lot of times. When you work with computers, most of them want X, Y, Z in that order. And people tend to say lat long. So there's lots of times when you're going to find that they're swapped, but not today. So that looks great, but GNU plot wants something that's got not commas, but it actually wants spaces between each of those. So we need to figure out how to convert those commas to spaces. And there's a command 
called tr for translate. And what you do is you give it the character that, that you don't want to have. So we have a comma, and we want to replace that with a space. And we can then take our output from the cut command, pass it into this with a pipe, so that vertical bar, and then we can use a new control thing where we send it to a file. So this is a redirect, and it's the greater than symbol, and then some file. <coughs> So this will send whatever's going here, it sees this symbol, says I'm going to send it to a file, and then you give it the name of the file that you want to put it in. So that way we can actually save what was going on with this set of commands. So if we say egrep, and I'm going to show you one more thing before I jump into that command. So before we use grep and it gave us matches, that first line with the program latitude launch and all that, it's going to confuse GNU plot. It doesn't like having random text in there. egrep has an option called dash v, as in Victor. And that swaps it so that it will throw out any line that matches. It's the exact opposite. Before, egrep grabbed everything that matched ODP or IODP. Now it's going to say anything that matches that string, throw that data away. So we're going to throw away that first line. So that will be this part right here. And if we do, see if I can get brave and do head, how bad it will be. So ignore the broken pipe nonsense coming from grep here. And so if you look here, here's the beginning of the command. So we did egrep minus v longitude, and then the holes.csv file, and that first line disappeared. So we got rid of that. So let's now combine that with our cut. So we're going to get rid of that first line, then we use the cut to grab out our latitude and longitude. Then we're going to use that translate, the tr command, to switch from a comma to a space. Minute w to copy that, and we'll do control y to yank. And then we'll pipe that to head, and we'll do the redirection in a second to a file. So if you look here, thankfully we only got one little broken pipe warning. So we did a egrep to grab, get rid of the first line, the cut to pull out the latitude and longitude, the translate to switch the comma to the space, and then we only grab the first 10 lines, and here we have longitude and latitude in two nice columns with a space in between. So let's send that to a file. We'll call it xy.dat. So if we now do head xy.dat, we now have our data. Looks pretty good. Um, I'm just not seeing. Okay. This Yep, this is when you get tripped up very easily because th there's a lot of punctuation running around. In your case, you left in the vertical bar. Oh, we don't need that. Yeah, that vertical bar oh. goes away and it's replaced with this. So right here, if you had a vertical bar and that, then it's going to basically eat your data or give you an error. Oh. So did you go up and you can go up here and edit this guy? Control E. And that works too, yep. So replace the vertical bar and head. Replace the whole thing. Yeah, right there. Now do the greater than and the xy dot dat. I promise you, you get to know the whole keyboard really well. OK, press enter. Press enter again. Hmm, what's going on? Send it the signal break. And go ahead and just type the command again from scratch or something. There's some trouble. That's a, a good one. That wiped out the file, so you need to run the command again. Yeah, yeah. You wrote something new on top. So there's a, an important point, and we'll, I was going to explain this t later on in the class, but we won't make, we won't make it till Tuesday. Every time you do this, this file, if there's something there, will get destroyed. So every time you do this command, it's going to wipe out anything that's there before and write right over the top of it and do it without telling you. It's pretty easy to destroy a file that you really wanted to have around. Are you having troubles here? Yeah, at first when I was putting in that command, it just gave me, it brought me over here with mm -hmm. the little yep. greater than symbol or whatever. But nah, I, don't know, I just tried typing it. Another good key is uh, meta greater than. And that'll take you to the end of the terminal. Oh, which I can just do right here. Yeah, but you actually, you're, you have a couple problems. One is the TR needs a space after it. Yeah. And then you have a vertical bar where there needs to be the greater than. Oh, yeah. 
try ahead of your xy.dat, just to make sure it looks good. Head space xy.dat. Awesome. Well, let's make a plot. There, this plotting program is called GNU plot. So run GNU plot. And let's plot this data. Plot. Now here you have to use a single quote. It does not like double quotes for some reason. It's very grumpy. So plot space xy dot dat. Press enter. And you're going to get a graph of global plots. Someone tell me what they think. Does this look good? Does this look like it's the right thing? Or is there something weird about this file? Let's get everybody up so they've got a plot going. Go ahead and hit enter. And this is uh, where we learn that real data has real warts. Uh, uh. You getting close? Um, yeah, I don't have an uh, install. What is it? Is it just GNU pseudo plot? apt get GNU? GNU plot? Okay. Go ahead and plot it. Have you plotted the data yet? So type, uh, I have the command up there on the top window. It's plot space single quote and then xy dot dat single quote press enter. Hey, some of you are reading ahead. <laughs> So this is clearly not a happy data set. Lat long, it goes from minus 180 to plus 180, so the longitude looks OK. The latitude is going up here to latitude of 5,000 something or other. Clearly, there's something wrong. The hint is, is that somebody put the decimal place in the wrong point in the database. Mm -hmm. So these files, when they're up here at 56 or 57, Thousand that actually should be 57.07. .07. But what we can do, we're not going to go fix that database yet. We'll fix it later on, and we'll do a lot more with it. We can go back to our plot over here and say set y range. I'm just going to go ahead and give it to you because we're not going to spend more time with this. But we'll set it to be minus 90 to plus 90, and we're going to ignore anything outside of that plot range. Set y range, and then we'll go back up to our plot. Press enter again. And if you've got a good imagination, you should now be able to see Africa, Asia, and whatnot in the, all the continents that should be white space. Plus, there's a lot of white space all over the globe because we only have 3,000 something cores for the whole world, which means that we've missed most of the world. Go ahead and do the plot again. Yeah. Yep. Or you can just scroll up and then hit enter on that other line. Now, if you want to see what's going on in that data file, we can quit out of this, quit. And do you remember the command from homework, min max? And we can say xy dot dat. So we can see that our longitude range, minus 179 and something to 70, 179 and something. The latitude, the southern hemisphere looks pretty good, minus 77. But we've got that 57,000 and whatnot. So we can then see that, that the latitude doesn't make a lot of sense. So this way, we haven't really dug into data too far, but we've been able to identify a class of problems in our data that we then have to fix before we can make a map of all the holes. And so right now, it's end of the class for today. We did pretty good today. We jumped through a lot of Emacs hoops. If you're new to Emacs, I'm sure your brain is probably overloaded. We're going to go through them again. Just keep asking. That's the best way to do it is when you get stuck as ask. I will also put in the uh, class notes for today a link. Well, I'll, I'll rebuild them tonight or tomorrow. And I'll put in a link to a cheat sheet that you can print out that if you make it double sided, it's one piece of paper. And it has several hundred of these keys on it. There will probably be 80% of them that if you ask me what they do, I don't know. There will be some funky Emacs thing that I've never tried. But the basics will be in there too. So the cheat sheet has got some really great commands uh, and a lot more than I know. Because I don't know even maybe 5% of Emacs. That would be awfully generous. I don't think I know that much. Great job on all the questions. So this file that is the um, virtual machine is getting updated all the time. Like with what? Every time you edit something, it's going in there. Yep. Yeah, that's cool. Yep. The one trouble is right now the way we're doing it is it's not going anywhere else. So you're not getting to save that some other place. So we're going to create a log file, and we're going to put that in the Dropbox. And then we're also going to learn other ways to push it around, shove that data where we want it to be. Yeah. Like, which command did you run that said file exists? Like the tar command? Yeah. You can rm the old one. So you remember the rm command? 
So if you have rm homework dash your name, where you've replaced this dot tar dot bz2, if you make a new tar and then you try to compress it, it's going to complain that this is already here. So do the rm command and then the tar, delete this file, and then run bz bzip2 dash 9, and then this part. It's a learning experience, so you know, getting it wrong is actually OK right now. We really want you to, the process of getting it towards right is what matters more than getting it right the first time. <laughs>